What is going on guys? Welcome back. This video today is a crash course on the structured query language also called SQL or SQL depending on how you want to pronounce it. And this is the database language, the relational database language. So the language that we use to interact with relational databases to create tables to insert stuff into tables, to make connections to alter tables to group by to aggregate and so on. And this is especially important for data scientists. Now what you see here today, this video today is actually a compilation of the individual episodes that I've already released on this channel in my SQL tutorial series. However, experience shows and past videos show that compiling the individual episodes into one video into one course, so to say, usually goes better and more people watch it. So individual videos are oftentimes not watched, especially when uh, we get to we get further in the series part five, part six, and so on. So I'm compiling this again into one video. So in the individual sections here, you will hear me talk about, you know, in the next video or in the last video, and I'm referring to the individual sections here. So these are six videos compiled together to one crash course. So I hope you can learn something and I hope you enjoy it. Let us get right into it. All right, now for this tutorial series, I would like to keep everything language independent and language neutral, meaning we're not going to focus on one specific implementation of a database system, we're not going to uh, make this tutorial series about MySQL or about Postgres or about SQLite or something like that. We're going to learn SQL or SQL in general, I'm going to jump back and forth between the two pronunciations because both are correct. I like to usually call it SQL. But when I say something like MySQL, I like to say MySQL. Uh, both are correct. So pronounce it however you like. But we're not going to focus on one specific implementation, one specific database system, we're going to learn SQL in general, and most of it is basically the same in the different implementations. So when I show you something in MySQL, you will probably be able to maybe with some minor changes run the same thing in Postgres or in SQLite. So this is a uh, for the most part, this is a language or dialect independent dialect neutral uh, tutorial, I, I should say. However, we still need to go with an implementation because I don't want to just write the code in a text editor and never run it. And because of that, we're going to go with MySQL because it's uh, very beginner friendly, very simple. Uh, and how you install MySQL depends on your operating system, you just have to go to downloads and follow the instruction essentially. I think you're intelligent enough to figure it out for your specific operating system. So if you have Mac OS, just Google how to install MySQL on Mac OS. On Windows, I think the installation is quite simple, I will briefly show you how to do it uh, on Linux, or at least on Ubuntu based systems. Uh, now some of you guys are not going to like this. Because uh, I installed it using snap. So what you do is you basically say sudo apt install MySQL server. So sudo apt install MySQL dash server. And this is basically just the database server. Uh, and then the tool that I'm working with here for this tutorial series is the MySQL workbench, you don't have to use this tool, you can also use uh, dbeaver or you can use uh, data grip from JetBrains if you have the premium version or if you pay for it or if you are a student or if you have a trial version, whatever, uh, use the software that you want. I'm going to use MySQL workbench because it's just the the most convenient cho uh, choice for making a tutorial, I would never use this editor because it doesn't support Vim bindings. But for the tutorial, uh, I'm going to just use the MySQL workbench. And to install it, what we need to do is we need to say sudo snap install MySQL dash workbench dash community. In my case, it's already installed. So I'm not going to run that. Uh, and then what you can do is you can run the service. So sudo system CTL start MySQL or MySQL dot service. In my case, it should already be running. So this uh, this is not necessary. And then what you want to do at least on Linux systems, I'm not sure if this is necessary on Windows and Mac, but what I had to do is I had to do sudo MySQL. Uh, and then when I'm inside, I had to set a root password. So I had to basically, let me just copy this here so that I can show you the command. Uh, like this. I had to run this statement in the MySQL prompt. So you say sudo MySQL and then 
alter user root at localhost identified with MySQL native password by, and then you can choose a password. I chose password here. And the important thing now is that once you run this and then you exit from the MySQL shell, what you need to do is you need to open the MySQL workbench. And here you have your connection and you need to edit this connection so that the password that you're setting here um, is password. So you set this to password and then you can just click on it. And here I have my prepared videos. You're going to see what they're about in the future episodes. Uh, but this is now the MySQL workbench connected to your database, to your MySQL database. And this is what you need as a setup here. Now, I trust you to be intelligent enough and capable enough to figure out the steps in between if something goes wrong, if you get some error message, if you don't have privileges, if uh, things change a year from now, which is likely to happen, that you can Google your way around into the installation so that you get this running on your system, whatever the system is. So I don't want to focus too much on this. I want to focus on SQL itself, especially because this tutorial is not about MySQL, but about SQL in general. So I don't want to spend too much time here talking about the specifics of installing MySQL. Um, yeah, so the basic thing that we have here, I already have a database here that I used to prepare the videos. Uh, what you have here by default is you have some MySQL server with databases. And if you want to see what databases there are by default, you can just go and say show and then databases. And then you use a semicolon to uh, terminate this line to say, okay, this is now the end of the command. And then you can click on this uh, Thunderbolt button here uh, to run this statement. So you can click on this and you can see that first of all, and by the way, if this is somehow uh, not visible, you probably have to, to drag it from the bottom like this, drag it up from the bottom like this. Um, you're going to see that this action was executed successfully. This is what you get down below here. Uh, and you can see here the result of running this command. And in my case, you can see I have this neural DB, you will not have such a database, but you will have information schema, MySQL performance schema and sys at least in MySQL. This is going to differ probably between the different uh, database systems that you use. But this command shows you what databases there are. Now in databases, what we have is we have data and the data is structured in rows. And those rows are located in tables and those tables are in a database. So the basic structure is you have a database. In this database, you have different tables being somewhat connected or also independent. In those tables, you have different columns, different attributes, you could say, and one row filling the values of these different columns is one data entry, one piece of data in the database. So again, databases inside of those databases, tables inside of those tables, columns and rows and they can be connected. So in this video today, in the first episode here, I want to talk about the very basics of SQL. So the very basics of creating a database, creating a table in that database, defining the different columns of that table, and then adding some data into that table, and then querying the data out of the table. So going through the basic process of using databases. Uh, so the first thing that we want to do is we want to say create database. And then we can pick a name for the database. So for example, tutorial DB, and always uh, end the command with a semicolon. So create database tutorial DB will now create a new database, which you can also add here to make this uh, less prone to errors is you can say create database if not exists. And what you will notice here is that SQL is very much like the Eng English language. So you can just tell it what to do. You say create a database if it does not exist tutorial DB. And the reason you want to add this if not exists is because in this way, if I run this command, and I can also run a command by holding control and pressing enter. So control enter will run this line. And you can see it created a database tutorial DB, I can now run this show database command again. And you can see we have this tutorial DB down here. And the reason we have this if not exists is because if I run this now again, you can see that I get a warning, but I don't get an error. So it says, okay, the command was executed, but this database already exists. Whereas if I remove this, if I just say create database tutorial DB, you can see I get an error that's uh, that tells me that it cannot create a database. So 
this is just a nice way of not worrying about uh, executing the command again if it was already executed. So now we have this database, but this database is empty. We don't have anything in it. And we can see that this is the case by showing the tables that are part of that database. But before we can run the show tables command, we need to actually say that we want to use this database. As you saw, we have five different or in my case now six different databases here. And when we when we do something like show tables, we need to specify which database we're actually using to see the table. So we can say here, use and then tutorial DB to say that we're actually using tutorial DB. Um, you can see this executed successfully. And now I can say show tables. And the reason I'm writing in uppercase, by the way, is just because this is how you usually write uh, SQL code, there's nothing that uh, prevents you from just saying show tables like this. It's not wrong. So you're not going to get an error if you write it like that. But when you look at code examples, you will always see the SQL statements being written in uppercase. So I like to do that as well. Show tables, and then you can see we have no tables here. So tables in tutorial DB, we have no entries here. So what we can do now is we can create a new table. And we do that guess what with the command create table. And we can also again say if not exists, so that I can run the command multiple times, and it will not crash because the table already exists. So create table if not exists. And let's go with people, for example. So create table if not exists people. And now what we need to do here in this create statement is we need to say, okay, what part, uh, what kind of attributes, what columns are going to be part of that people table. So when I have a person, what attributes am I going to have for a person? And for this, we use these parentheses here. And again, we separate uh, or not we separate, we end the line or the command with a semicolon. Um, and in between those parentheses here, now we specify the different fields. So for example, we can say a person has an ID, a unique identifier. So I can say P underscore ID, you can call this whatever you want. You can also call it this if you want to. So there's no convention here that you have to follow. Otherwise, it won't execute. Uh, but it's a good practice depending on what you're working on and what code base you're working with, uh, that you do something like p underscore for people underscore and then PID or actually p underscore ID would be enough and uh, enough in this case. So what we need to specify now for this PID is what is it actually so a data type we need to say, okay, this PID is an integer. And you can say that it's an integer by saying int, or by saying integer doesn't really matter. It's basically the same. So now we have this PID, which is an integer, and now we can add some other information about it. So for example, we can say uh, that it's unique, we can say it, it's, n it's not an allowed to be null. And we're going to talk about these constraints in a future video. But one of the constraints that we need to talk about here right now is the primary key. So we need to say that this is a primary key. And the reason for that is because every table or every row in a table needs to have a unique identifier. And the primary key basically just says, this attribute here is unique, and it is not allowed to be null. So it can't be empty, and it can't have duplicates, which means every single row is going to have a value for PID and no two rows are going to have the same values. Uh, so because of that, we have now a unique identifier, which is called the primary key. And this is going to be interesting and relevant when we have also foreign keys later on referencing that primary key to make connections. But this is something that we're going to talk about in uh, one of the later videos in this series. Now we're going to just say, okay, we have this PID, which is the unique identifier for a person. If you don't want to call this ID, you can also use something like social security number. In this case, we would use a different data type, probably. So we could say the social security number of a person is uh, a text, uh, or maybe text is too large. Let's go with a character of size 32. So we have the social security number is a string of length 32. And this is the unique identifier because no two people will have the same social security number. So we're going to stick with the ID for now. But this is also a possibility. Now talking about the data types, let me just briefly go through most of them or put the a most important one so that we have this covered for the sake of completeness. Um, a field can be an integer, a field can be a character, 
uh, as I showed you. So character would be uh, fixed size, usually also faster than the alternative of the variable character, where we have essentially uh, a character, but it's of variable size, meaning the 32 indicates the maximum size, but not uh, the actual size. So it's not like this is uh, always going to be of length 32. It can also be of length 15, but the max size is going to be 32. And then we also have the text and the text is essentially uh, for very long texts, you could say. So character, when you have a small predictable size, variable character, when you have to have room for a lot of text, but you don't need all of the text necessarily, and text when you have large text. Then we also have um, enumerations. Enumerations are essentially um, enumeration of values. So we have a certain number of values that are possible. For example, we could say, uh, favorite programming language can be C++, can be Java, or can be Python. And this is basically like a string then, but we cannot add something like Go to this list. Um, and then we also have stuff like float, stuff like double, and stuff like decimal, where we can specify um, also the decimal places. And uh, what else do we have? We have Boolean data types, basically true or false values. Uh, and then we have also date and time and date time and timestamps. Now, the reason I'm going through this quite quickly is because I don't want to show you examples for every single data type. We're going to use some of them as we go on with this tutorial series. We don't have to go through examples for every single one of them now. Uh, but essentially, that's, uh, those are the most important data types. So you can store different types of information, uh, different types of information in a database. So let us move on now with the name, which is going to be a variable character of let's say size, size 255. And then we're going to have h, which is going to be an integer. And then we're going to have height, which is going to be float, for example. So this is how we create a table. We say create table if not exists, the table is called people, we have four columns in that table. And those are the data types. And this is also primary key. Now I can run this. Then I can uh, say show tables. And you can see we have a people table. That is uh, what we just created. Now this people table is empty. And we can see that it is empty by trying to select everything from the table. So there is a statement in SQL, which is called the select statement. And what you do essentially is you specify which columns you want to select. So you say select PID, P name, PH, P height, or just P name, PH. Uh, or simply you can say everything. So you can say select asterisk, and then from because you can have multiple tables from people, for example, and this would give me all the data that is in the people table. In this case, we have Oh, did I change something right now. Let me run this again. Uh, oh, this one actually, there you go. Uh, so we have PID, P name, PH, P height, we can see the column structure, but there is no data in here. So we don't have anything. Those are just null values. Um, so what we can do now is we can insert data into this table. And how do we do that? Guess what insert into, then we need to say people, and then we have two options, either we're going to specify all the attribute values, or just some of them. Because remember, the PID has to be specified, it cannot be null, but I can leave out all of these values. So I can also say just a name and an, and an ID, and I don't need to care about age and height. If I want to limit myself to certain fields, I have to specify which ones I'm feeling, uh, not feeling, <laughs> which ones I'm filling um, in parentheses. So I need to say, okay, I'm inserting into people, a PID and a P name, um, and not anything else. And then this is followed by the values keyword. And then I use again, parentheses followed by a semicolon to say what kind of values am I actually putting into the table now, and I could start with something like ID one, and name, Mike, and I can run this. And when I run this, I can call the select from people, select everything from people statement again. And you can see I have ID one, Mike. Um, I can also go ahead and get rid of all this. 
and I can say insert into people values. Now, if I do it like that, I have to provide all the fields. If I don't limit myself to specific fields explicitly, I need to provide all of the fields. Otherwise, it's not going to accept that. So I can say here to John, and then um, John is going to be 78. And he's going to have a height of 180 centimeters. Insert, select, and you can see now we have Mike and John with all the data. Um, as I said, since we have this as a primary key, we cannot just specify everything else. So I cannot just say p name, p h, p height, and then omit this ID because in this case we would say we would get this error message that the field PID doesn't have a default value and it's also primary key. So we cannot just insert without it. Uh, yeah. So that's basically the insert command. Now, what else can we do? We can also, of course, this is important. I didn't mention this explicitly. We can, of course, also insert multiple, um, multiple instances here or multiple rows in one command. So I can say here, PID again, but this is a valid command again. And then I can just list a couple of those, uh, those insert rows like this. And of course, we're going to need a comma here to separate them. And in the end, again, a semicolon. Uh, but this is how how you can also do it. So you can say here three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then we can say Anna, we can say Bob, we can say Kate, we can say James. Uh, Samuel and Lisa, something like this. And then we can change the values here. And we can also change the sizes a little bit. Like this. Uh, yeah, so we can run this. And we can select again everything from people. And there you go, we have all the data now in the database. Which brings us to the next point, how can I not select everything but just specific rows? And I, I'm not talking about specific columns here because we said already how we can do that. I can also say p name and ph to only get name and h as a result here. Uh, but how do I select, for example, only those that are older than 40 years, for example, would make sense in this case. This is where the where clause comes into play. So I can say select p name and age from people. And I can attach here a where statement where the age is above and I can just use the simple above or greater than operator here 30. And I can run this. And you can see here I only get the entries where I'm above 30 or I can say 40. And then I'm only going to get those above 40. And this works also with less than this works also with equal. So I can go and say equals 38, then I'm going to get only those that are exactly 38 years old, I can go and say not equal 38, which is done like this. As you can see, and I can also say um, that uh, I want to have where h is not null, because I think we have here if I run this again, we have one instance where we have no h, which is Mike, I can also say where p underscore h is not null. And then I'm not going to get Mike. Uh, yeah, so that is that what we can also do is we can also filter based on attributes that we're not displaying. So I can say, give me name and age where the height of the person is above 180 centimeters. There you go. Uh, all right. I think that's it. One more thing maybe that could be interesting is uh, we want to show, for example, combinations here. So we want to say, give me the name and age where the people are taller than 180 and their age is above uh, 40, for example. Then we only get Kate and James. Or I can say, or where the age is above 40. So in this case, we would get... Uh, who did we get here? John? Was it John? How how tall is John? Let me just see. Yeah, so even though John is not above 180, 
we still get John because he's above 40 and or means that, uh, yeah, that we get when one of the two is, uh, at least one of the two is fulfilled. We can also say X or to get only when either or. So only when the height is above 180 or uh, when the age is above 40, but not when both is the case. So those are just a, log a logical uh, combinations here. All right, so last time we started to cover the basics of SQL. Today, we're going to continue to do that. Last time we created a new database tutorial DB. Inside of that database, we created a new table people with these attributes here. And we also learned about select statements and insert statements. So we learned how to add new data to the database or to a table in the database. We learned how to select from a table and how to also specify conditions for the selection. And in today's video, we're going to learn how to update values. So not how to insert new values, but how to change existing values, how to delete existing values, and then how to also change the entire table structure. So how can we change data types of parameters here or of uh, columns of attributes? How can we change the name? How can we change the table itself, not just the data in the table? So we're going to start with a simple update. Now, this is the table as we have it right now. This is the content one, two, three, up until eight with the different names here with the different uh, ages and heights. Now, Mike has no age and no height. How can we change that? Uh, let's say we want to set the age of Mike to 30 and we want to set the height to 179, for example. How do we do that? We do that with an update statement. So we say update and then people, which is a table that we're targeting. And then we use the set command. So update people set. And then we can say what we want to change. For example, pH equals and then I can say 30. And then I have to provide uh, a condition. So where do I set this age to 30? Because if I just do it like that, it's going to set all the ages to 30, at least in SQLite, this is what it's going to do. We want to set the age to 30 for Mike. So we can say either where P name is Mike or where PID is one, which is better because we can have two mics and then we would set the age for both mics. In this case, we only have one mic, so you can do uh, you can do that however you like. I'm going to say where PID equals one. That is the update statement. I can run this. It is executed successfully. I can run the select statement again. And now you can see Mike has the age 30. And I can also say now that I want to set the height. So P height is going to be 179. And then I can select. There you go. So now we have some values. This is the update statement. Now we can also delete an entire entry. So we can delete an entire record. For example, James might be no longer a customer if this is a customer base. So we can delete James from the database. Uh, so we can say delete from people where and then P underscore ID equals six. Now this is a unique identifier. So when you do it like that, you will always delete just one entry. I can again also just say P name um, equals James, or maybe even more interesting than that, maybe I want to delete all people below the age or above the age of 50, for example, because for some reason, my offer that I'm using my database for is only targeted towards people below the age of 50. So what I could do is I can say, okay, delete all the people where the age of those people is above 50. Like this. And when I run this, uh, oh, I'm using safe mode. So chances are you also have to change this setting, we need to say set SQL underscore safe underscore updates equals zero. Then I need to run this. And then I can do that. There you go. And now if I select, you can see that there is no person here with age above 50. And this is not just a select statement. Those people are no longer in the database at all. So they're not part of the people table anymore. So this is how you update and how you delete. Now, let's say I'm going to insert a new value here. Let's say I insert into people. And I'm just going to go now with PID P name and P height, I don't care about the H. 
and I'm going to insert come on, values. Uh, let's go with ID 10. I know nine is free, but I'm going to go with 10. Then let's go with uh, James since James is no longer here. And then we're going to go with remember, this is a floating point number. So we can actually say 178.23. So this is the case right now. If I select from people after running this statement, you can see I have a floating point number, which is possible because this is not an integer, this is a float. So let's say though, I want to change this now. For some reason, I have a problem with height being a float. I want to change it to an integer. How do I do that? I do that with an alter table command because I want to alter the table structure, the way the table works. So I can actually go ahead and say alter table people and I can change the data type of the height from float to int. I can say, um, I can say modify. And I think this is actually a difference uh, in the dialect. So if you use MySQL, you can say alter table people modify column. And what we do then is we say p underscore height integer. So this is how you would do that in MySQL. I think in other database systems, you have to say alter table people alter column p height. So this might be different in your uh, dialect of SQL. So if I run this now, and if I select again, you can see that James no longer has a floating point number, it was truncated. So it's only 178 now. So this is how you can change the data type and uh, the column itself. Now we can also rename the column so I can say alter table. And uh, then I can say people rename column height to something like, I don't know, to p underscore size, something like this. And then when I select everything from people, you can see I have p size instead of p height. But of course, this is not a good name. So I'm going to change that back to height. Uh, of course, we can also add new columns to the table. So I can actually go ahead and say alter table, people, add column. And I can say I want to have a weight column, which is also a float. And then when I select from people, of course, this column is going to be null everywhere. But we have a new weight column, which we can change and uh, we can change the null values to values, we can fill in uh, new values for new entries. So this is now a new column in the table. I can of course also drop the column again. So I can say alter table people drop column p weight. And by doing that, we no longer have the column. And of course, I can also drop all of the table. So I can actually say, drop the full table and delete it. So it's not no longer here. But before I do that, I want to show you another command, which sounds similar at first, but it's different. It's the truncate table command. Now drop table removes the entire table, the table is gone, it doesn't exist anymore. Truncate table keeps the table, but removes all the data from the table. So if I say truncate table people, if I run this, and if I select them, you will see that we don't have any data in the table anymore. I can also say drop table. And I can also, of course, say drop table if exists, because I don't want to drop a table that does not exist. But I can say drop table if exists people. And now if I say select from people, it will tell me there is no table people. And I can, of course, rerun this command because it has an if exists. But if I remove this, it will tell me the same thing. This table does not exist. Yeah, so that's it. We can drop tables, we can alter tables, we can drop columns, we can add columns, we can truncate tables. Um, and yeah, this is just a little bit more of the basics now. So we know now how to create a table, how to fill it up with values, how to query specific values with certain conditions with certain filters, we know how to change the table structure, how to update individual records, how to delete records, how to truncate the full table, and how to drop the full table, how to remove the table entirely. All right, so up until this point, we already covered a lot of the SQL basics, we talked about the basic CRUD operations, so create, read, update, delete. 
And today we're going to talk about constraints. So things that we can add to individual columns to constrain them uh, to say, for example, they have to be unique, the values in that column have to be unique, uh, the column cannot have any null values, or the column has to have values in the range between x and y, if it's a numerical column, for example, stuff like that. This is what we're going to talk about today. And one of the constraints that we already talked about is this primary key constraint. So the primary key constraint, again, is just unique and not null. So it says, this ID here cannot have any duplicate values. So no two different rows can have the same ID. And also, it's not allowed to be null. So there always has to be an ID value, and it always has to be unique. Now, the constraints that make up the primary key can also be used separately. And for this, we're going to change this uh, table structure here a little bit. And first of all, I'm going to drop the table, if exists, people, I'm actually not sure if it exists right now. So drop table. And then we're going to create a table again with ID name, and then we're going to use here, uh, social security number, which is going to be a character of size 32. Um, and what we want to do here is a couple of things. So first of all, we want this social security number, by the way, not semicolon, just like this. Uh, we want the social security number to be unique, but we don't have to have it every time. So it's not going to be our unique identifier here. It's not going to have to be present every time but it's going to have to be unique if it is present. So what we can do here is we can just say unique. And this would mean that no two rows can have the same value for social security number. This is already a constraint. This is like primary key, I now have here PID integer primary key. And here I have SSN uh, character 32 unique, making this a character of size 32. That's unique and character meaning string. Um, for the name, for example, I can say the name does not have to be unique, I can have 100 different mics, and that's fine. But I want to have a name. So I'm going to say this is not null. So now when I create uh, an entry here, when I add an entry, when I add data to the table, I have to pass a name because the name is a non null uh, column, I have to have a value there. And for the age, for example, I can do a default value. So if no age is provided, that's fine, we don't need to have a uh, and age provided, but if no value is provided, I want to have a default value. So I can say default, for example, 21. So those are already a couple of constraints, primary key, as I mentioned, not null, meaning I have to provide a value default, meaning if no value is provided, just go with 21. And unique meaning no two SSNs can be the same. Now, what I can also do here is I can add a new constraint for the age, I can add an additional constraint for the age, uh, which I can specify down here with a constraint keyword. So I can say constraint, and I can call it whatever I want. Let's go with age constraint, for example. Uh, and the age constraint is going to check, I'm going to use the check keyword here, it's going to check that the p underscore h is greater than or equal to zero. So you cannot have a negative h. And I also want it to be below uh, below 200, because there's no one who's 200 years old, at least as of right now. So this is the range that I want to have the age in. So this is another constraint, I'm not going to be allowed to enter negative 10 or 300 for the age. So those are constraints now. So let's go and create this table. And now let's try to insert some values. So insert into, and then people, let's go with PID and P name. Now those are the only two columns that are not allowed to be null. So I have to provide them. So values are going to be let's go with um, with one and with Mike, again, like this. So this worked because I didn't violate any constraints. But if I now go and say select everything from people, and I run this, you can see that I have Mike with an age of 21. So this default constraint kicked in. Now, if I try to create with the same ID, Jane, of course, it's not going to work. We already saw that in the previous video, primary key has to be unique. Um, but let's go for example, now and create a second Jane. And let's say Jane is 25. And Jane has a certain social security number. So for example, a h 77812. 
let's say this is what a social security number looks like. I'm going to insert this. And what's the problem here? Oh, I didn't provide these columns. So PHP SSN. There you go. Now it works. I can select again. You can see we have the social security number. Now let's say I want to insert value three for the ID, then a name, uh, Angela for the name, and then I want to have 54. And I want to use the same social security number. If I try to do that, you can see duplicate entry, I cannot insert this into the table. This doesn't work because it violates the unique constraint for the SSN. So this is a problem. Uh, if I change this to a three, then it works because now it's a different social security number. There you go. All right. Now, oftentimes the ID is not going to have any information. Uh, or actually, before we go into this, I want to show you first of all, the DH also works. So if I say uh, four, and now we have john, and we have some unique social security number like this. Um, if I say john is negative 10 years old, you can see this violates the age constraint here. If I say john is 300, you can see this violates the age constraint again. And even if I say 200, this is going to violate the age constraint because we have less than if I say less than or equal to, um, I would have to recreate the table. So I'm not going to do that. But then it would work. Okay. Now, oftentimes, what we have is we have an ID that is a unique identifier, but it's essentially a row number. So it's one, two, three, four, five, and so on. And it doesn't really matter what the content of the ID is. It just matters that it's unique and not null. So that is what we need. We want to have some identifier, but it doesn't carry any information. It's not a social security number. It doesn't say anything about the person. It's just some number. In this case, it doesn't matter what it is. So we can also automatically increment it instead of specifying it every time. So instead of saying PID, P name, PH, PSSN, I can just say P name, PH, PSSN, or even just P name. And the ID will be automatically incremented. So if I say something like, in this case, when I recreate the table, now I'm going to need a Mike again. And we're going to need a john again. So this would be enough to create new entries right now. If I run this, you can see the ID field is not specified. But if I now add an additional constraint here, auto underscore increment, this basically means create or, or automatically increment the ID every time you enter something into the table. So I'm going to drop the people's table, I'm going to create it again. And now I can insert Mike and John. And when I select, you can see one, two, and I can do that a couple of times because the name is not unique. So I can do that. And now you can see we have Mike, John, Mike, John, Mike, John, Mike, John, with these IDs being incremented. So this is also an interesting constraint. Um, yeah, so what else can we do? We can also apply constraint onto multiple fields. So let's change the people's table here again. Let's say we have a first name, which is a variable character, let's say 255. And uh, I want to have a last name, which is going to also be a variable character of length 255. Um, and what I want to do now is I want to say, okay, the first name doesn't have to be unique, the last name doesn't have to be unique, but I want a combination of the first name and the last name to be unique. So it's okay if I have a Mike Smith and a Mike Stone. And it's okay if I have a Mike Smith and a Jane Smith, but I don't want to have two Mike Smiths. So what I can do here is I can say again, constraint. And I can say uh, name underscore constraint unique and then I have to pass in parentheses here the p underscore first name and the p underscore last name like this uh, again no semicolon here so drop the table again and now I can specify the first name and the p last name and I can specify here Mike Mike Smith and I can specify also John Smith. And this is not going to be a problem. You can see this works Mike Smith, John Smith, and I can also copy this now and I can insert a Mike Stone and a John Stone. That's no problem either. 
But if I now try to enter again a Mike Smith or a John Smith, then you can see duplicate entry with Mike Smith for key. So yeah, this is the constraint for that. And of course, what we can also do is we can add constraints to existing tables. So right now, um, the first name and the last name combination is unique, but I can also say, okay, I want the last name to be unique after I created the table. Now, the problem here would be, of course, that if I do it right now, it would violate already the constraint because we already have some data that violates this constraint. So if I say now, alter table people, and I say add constraint, and I say, I don't know, unique underscore last name, uh, and the constraint is unique, and it applies to p underscore last name, then this is not going to work because there's already data that violates this constraint. So what I would have to do is I would have to truncate, I mean, I don't have to truncate the table, but I would have to resolve this conflict, uh, which I could do by just truncating the table. And now I can add the constraint. Now we don't have any data, of course, but now this would not work anymore because now I have the entry Smith and Smith, which is problematic. But it would work, of course, if I would have uh, Mike Smith and Mike Stone, because the first name is still not unique. Yeah. All right, so we're going to talk about more advanced SQL queries in this video today, advanced in this context, meaning not just the basic select from where statements that we already covered, but we're going to add some more elements to the queries in this video today. And we're going to use this people table here with this sample data. I prepared all of this before the video because this is all stuff that we already covered. So it's nothing new. Um, the people table has an ID, name, age, height, gender. We have an auto increment here, an enum here, and this is the sample data. You can choose whatever sample data you want. I just made up some values so that we have something to work with. And the first keyword, the first element that I want to talk about here is the distinct keyword. Now, maybe as a reminder here from the first video, from the first episode, the basic structure of a select statement is select, then what you want to select. So either column names or an asterisk for everything. So we could say P name, P H from then the table name, and then we can uh, specify a where condition optionally. So where uh, H is above uh, 30, for example. So if I run this, uh, first of all, of course, we need to drop the table, create a new table, insert the data and then select. This is what we already know about nothing special here. So what we can do now here is we can add a keyword called distinct and distinct basically goes through the results and eliminates duplicate rows. So if I have uh, 10 different people called Mike with the age 20, I'm only going to see one time Mike 20. And I'm going to see all the other names and age combinations only one time. So I'm going to show you an example here. If I say distinct for this query here, nothing is going to change because I don't have any duplicate rows. I don't have anything. And I also didn't have anything before uh, where I have duplicates. I can also eliminate the where statement. And all these rows are uh, are unique, so we don't have anything uh, that can be called a duplicate. We do have uh, the same H in a couple of rows, but that doesn't matter. Um, if I only print the H, so if I say select PH from people and I run this, then it's a different thing. So now I have 55, 55 and 55. Those are duplicates. So if I now say select distinct H, we're only going to get one time 55. So you can see that we only get this once. And you can even see that this is the case uh, in a more extreme way if we go for the gender, because then we see male, female, female, male, and so on. And if I say distinct, we're going to get only uh, the unique entries here, male, female. So this is what the distinct keyword does. Now, what we can also do is we can uh, apply in the where statement. So this is now a different keyword. We can say select and then we can say, for example, uh, everything. So let's go with an asterisk here, select everything from people. But I want to say where and our comparisons or conditions that we have here or that we had here up until this point were basic comparisons like greater than equal to 
uh, not equal to less than stuff like this. And what we can also do is we can ask for uh, membership in a collection. So we can say, select all the people where the H is, so where PH is part of the following list. So I can use the in keyword to specify here the ages, the specific ages, not a range, but specific ages, for example, 55 and 65. And then I would only get people that are either 55 or 65 years old. That would be the in operator. Uh, we can also, for names especially, this is interesting, we can also use a like operator. The like operator doesn't match the string exactly. So if I say here p name equals uh, Mike, then this is going to be the exact match. If I have M-I-K, this is not going to work. Uh, so this is the exact comparison. Now I can also say like and then I can use percentage symbols here to say something like the name has to start with an M. In this case, Mike is the only one. But if I say J, for example, we can see John, Jeff and Jim. Or I can say um, has to end with an A. So percent A, Anna, Lisa, Angela. Or I can say something like uh, has to have an N in between somewhere. So percent N percent. And then we get all the names that contain an N in between not in the beginning and not in the end or actually in the end as well because percent can also be just nothing. So this is the like operator. Um, another thing that we can do and I'm going through the list right now. So I, I'm, I'm going to list a lot, a lot of things here and uh, cover them briefly. So what we can also do is we can use aliases. Now this is more of a representation thing. So this is not really functional, but I can say for example, p name as name with a capital N maybe, uh, and I can also use quotation marks for this, like this, so S name, uh, and then P H S H from people. And then I would get name and H as column names instead of P name and PH. And this is also something that we can do. Now, a category of things that we can do here are aggregate functions, we can apply aggregate functions on uh, in the query. So we can say, for example, uh, select pH from people that this would just list the ages, as you can see, but I can also say sum up the ages. So I can say select sum from pH. And in this case, it would just sum up all the ages, we would get this as a result. And of course, I can also say as and then I can provide a string h sum. There you go. So this also works here. Uh, I can do the same thing with the average, I can do the same thing with the minimum value. I can do the same thing with a maximum value. And I can do the same thing with count. So how many ages do we have, we can also just say count everything. So how many entries do we have. But if we have null values like this one here, so if I go for the p height, then I only get 10 because this is not counted as a valid entry. If I go for a specific column. Um, yeah, so those are aggregate functions, we can also uh, say, for example, I want to have the average height for so I can say, average height from people where the gender so the p gender equals male. And then I get the average height for males in my data set and also for females here. <clears throat> so those are two separate results. Now I can also by the way, uh, or actually I cannot do this here. So this would just give me one value for male one value for female. Now if I want to list uh, the category or if I want to group by this is already uh, saying what we're going to use here, if I want to group by a certain attribute. So for example, I want to group the data by gender, I want to separate it into male and female. Uh, then I can apply the aggregate functions on the different groups on the different subsets. So what this means is I can say here, for example, average of p underscore h, or height, maybe like this, from people, and then I can say group, let, let's maybe do this in a new line here, group by, and I can specify that I want to group by gender. And what this results in is 
uh, and actually I have to also specify the gender to see this. What this actually results in is I get two outputs, male, female, and the respective average. So we group by a categorical attribute, for example, here, the gender, and then I have for the individual subgroups that I have here, the average or the sum or the minimum or the maximum. Um, so this is what we can do. And we can also group by multiple uh, attributes. So I can group by gender and I can then also group by age and this would result in male, female and so on. And actually I also wanna print the age here. This would tell me, okay, males of age 55 have an average height of this and so on and so forth, as you can see here. So we group first by gender and then inside of the gender we group by age. That's, that's uh, what this means. All right, so this is the group by, we take, we group. Uh, now what you cannot do is you cannot just, um, you cannot just print the height in this, in this case because this results in an error because you either have to group by the attributes that you're showing or you have to use an aggregate function because what we're doing here is we're grouping by gender, we're grouping by age, then of course we can just show the gender and the age but the height is now no longer a value that we can rep, uh, that, that we can show for individual people. We have to show it with respect to a group. And because of that, we need to aggregate it in that group. And for this, we use, for example, average. All right, so that's the group by uh, statement. And another thing that we can do is we can also order the results. So we can say, for example, select everything from people and we want to order by, and we can say, for example, H. And then you can see we have 22 up until 89 in ascending order. I can also add a descending here, D-E-S-C, to get it in descending order, as you can see. And again, I can also order by uh, two attributes. So I can say, for example, here I have 55, 55, 55. Now in this case, they are already ordered. Maybe I can order by name then. So I can say first by age and then by name in ascending order. So you can see now I have Anna, Mike, Samuel. So when you look at the uh, first letters, it's now in order uh, inside of that age category. Uh, I can also do it the other way around. Then we're going to prioritize the name. So if I say P name first, PH second, that would mean first sort by name. And if we have the same letter, then we sort uh, by H. But in this case, we don't have it because or not just the same letter, the same name. Uh, in this case, we don't have it because uh, yeah, all the names are different. So if we would have uh, six Anna's, they would be sorted by H. That's the idea here. And finally, what I want to show you is we can also limit the output. So we can say, for example, select everything from people limit <clears throat> limit five and then I would just get five rows and this makes sense if I do something like where or maybe select from people order by ph limit five then I only get the five youngest entries here All right, so up until this point in the tutorial series we have only been working with one table namely the people table and today we want to look at relationships between multiple different tables. So for example, we have the people table and a person can own one or multiple things. And a thing can maybe be owned only by one person or it can be owned by multiple people. And then again, you can also have relationships between the same table. So people can be connected to other people. So you might have a friendship relation. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that. And then we're also going to look at joints, which are uh, things that allow us to do select statements across multiple tables so that we can uh, join multiple tables on specific columns and then we can have select statements that combine these tables so that we can have more data than just the data that is present in one table. This is what we're going to do today. And for this, we're going to start again by using tutorial DB, which we were working on all the time. And we're going to drop all the tables that we already have because I want to start here from scratch. So drop table if exists people. Um, I don't know actually if in my case I have more tables here. So let me just see use tutorial DB. Uh, no, we don't have any other tables. Okay, so we only have the people table. 
and we're going to drop that people table so that we create uh, can create it again from scratch. So create table if not exists. Come on, exists people with the following fields. We're going to have again an ID integer primary key auto increment. I'm not sure if I'm actually changing something here, but I'm going to go with name, which is a bar char 255. I just like to start from scratch so that I don't mess up anything. H is going to be an integer. Height is going to be a float. And then we have the gender, which is an enum male female. And I think actually this is the same structure that we had before. So maybe you don't have to drop the table. I just do it for uh, to make sure that I don't work with a different table here. So create table if not exists people. And now the idea is to have another table called things and things can have an owner. So we have different types of relationships when it comes to database relationships or table relationships. We have the so called one to one relationship. We have the one to n relationship or the n to one relationship. And we have the n to m uh, relationship. These are also called one to one, one to many, many to one or many to many. And the idea is that you can have certain things that can only work uh, on a one on one basis. So you might say, um, a thing can be owned by one person only and a person can own exactly one thing. So that would be uh, th that would be a one to one relationship. Now, it's not realistic, because things can usually sometimes be owned by multiple people, and a person can own multiple things. But if we say that a person can own exactly one thing, and a thing can be owned exactly by one person, that would be a one to one relationship. If I say, okay, a thing can only be owned by one person, but a person can own multiple things, that would be a one to n relationship. One person can own multiple things, a thing can only be owned by one person. And of course, I can sw uh, swap that to change uh, the cardinalities. And then we also have the idea that multiple people can own the same thing and a thing can be owned uh, and, and uh, people can own multiple things. So this would be many to many in both ways. Uh, that's the basic idea. And we're going to start here with a simple one to one relationship, we're going to say create table, if not exists things. And we're going to keep it simple here, all we're going to have is we're going to have a thing ID, which is going to be an integer primary key, auto increment, we're going to have a name, which is just going to be a variable character 255 not null. And we're going to have a description of the thing, which can be null, we don't have to provide it. And then we want to have uh, an owner. And what we do here now is the owner is not going to be of type person or people, it's going to be of the type that the primary key of the people is. So remember, the primary key is the identifier for the individual rows. So a person is identified by the PID, the PID is an integer. So when I say that the thing has an owner, I have to provide that this is also an integer because the integer, of course, uh, relates to the PID, or is the data type of the PID. Um, now, this right now, if I leave it like that, and of course, I would have to add a foreign key relationship. So I can I have to say here, foreign key, meaning that this is the key of another table. So here, it's just a foreign key here, it's just a field, but this field here is the primary key of the people table. And I say that by saying foreign key, T owner, references, people, PID, or yeah, people PID. So this basically says we have this owner field, which is just an integer. And this integer is actually referencing the primary key of the people table. Uh, yeah. So that is the basic structure here. Now, as of right now, as we look at this, this is a one to n relationship. Why? Because a person can own multiple things, because all I have to do to say that a person owns multiple things is I have to add new things. And I have to have the same person here as an owner. 
That is currently a one to end relationship. A thing cannot be owned by multiple people because I only have one owner field here. I don't have a collection. I don't have uh, any other structure here. I only have one number that each thing can be assigned here as an owner. Um, if I want to say that only a one to one relationship is possible, what I have to do is I have to say that this is unique. Because then, of course, think about it, every owner, every number for the owner ID can only occur exactly once. Meaning that if I have uh, the ID one present in the table, it cannot be present in any other row because it's unique. So it would be a one to one relationship. Uh, like this, it would be a one to end relationship. And of course, I can also flip it if I want to say, okay, a thing can be owned by multiple people, but a person can own only one thing, I would have to remove this field here, I would have to say p thing that the person owns. And this p thing would be a foreign key referencing the t owner TID. But that's, of course, not very realistic. Um, if I want to model the idea that we can have multiple owners and we can have multiple things being owned by the same person, uh, then we want to have a third table or we need to have a third table because that is how we model many to many relationships. We need to say that there is a third table, okay, table if not exists. And this table, we could call it ownership, um, keeps track of the ownerships. So we have here uh, O underscore owner, which is an integer. O underscore think, which is also an integer, because of course, here we reference again, the PID and the TID. And then we need to say here primary key. And we can have this is something new, we can have multiple fields forming a primary key together. So this alone is not a primary key, this alone is not a primary key, but those together are a primary key, they identify a row, they have to be unique and not null. So primary key, and then in parentheses, I just say, uh, O underscore owner, O underscore thing. And then of course, the same thing as above here, I need to reference both these fields as foreign keys. So foreign key. And then uh, I say, O underscore owner references people PID. And then I can copy this and O underscore thing actually references things TID. So that now and of course, I can then remove this field here that now models the idea of having a many to many relationship. So uh, th this now means that a person can have multiple things because all I have to do is I have to say which person owns what and then I can also have the same thing in the table multiple times, I can have the same owner, I just have to have uh, each combination only once in the table. Uh, yeah, so that is a many to many relationship. Now, before we go any further with the um, inserts, or, or actually with with the next table, we're going to start with the inserts here, because I want to show you with some sample data. Uh, how we can do some queries on this. And for this, I'm going to just copy paste some sample data. Um, you can either generate your own sample data, you can copy it from or you can you can type it from this video. Or I would recommend just go to chat GPT provide a create scripts and say, give me some sample data to work with this uh, to work with here. So we're going to just copy here from my second screen into the clipboard. These insert statements. So I'm going to show you here what I'm doing. Um, so we have the people table that we modeled here, we have here just some basic names, some basic ages some basic heights, I think those are now in I don't know what the oh, those are now in meters. Uh, and then we have genders and then we have down here things with some description. I also have uh, this is important, I have a person Mike non owner, which is not going to own anything. Uh, and I'm going to explain here why we need this person in a second. And I'm also going to have a thing that is not owned by anyone because all these other people are going to own things. All these other things are going to be owned by people. But Mike non owner will own nothing. And the MATLAB uh, fan club membership will not be owned by anyone for obvious reasons. So this is an item that is not owned by anyone. And this is uh, a person that doesn't own anything. 
Uh, and here we have the ownerships just referencing the different IDs. So person one owns item one, person one also owns item three and so on. Uh, and then we also have here uh, four owns five, but also two owns five. So they share ownership in this case. And now the question is, how can we actually select something uh, from this structure? So how can I say, uh, how can I formulate certain queries? Uh, before we get into any specific queries, I just want to introduce here now the concept of a join and the concept of the four different joins that we're going to look at. And for this, I'm going to first run all of this. So we're going to create table people. Uh, what's the problem here with things? Oh, yeah, of course, I removed the owner. So we're going to remove the foreign key constraint as well. And then the ownership. Then we insert data. Uh, okay, this is now still with the owner. So actually, let's just keep the owner as well. Why not? So let's just say it's going to be an integer like this. Now I need to drop the table to create it again. Thanks. There you go. Uh, cannot drop table. Yeah, of course, we need to drop. This is another thing when you drop tables, you need to make sure that you drop all the tables first so that you somehow um, make sure that the tables are not used somewhere else. So you need to first drop ownership, then things and then people. Uh, then we run this again, run this again, run this again, insert data, insert data, insert data. What's the problem here now? Ownerships doesn't exist. Uh, is it called ownership? Yeah, without an S. There you go. Okay, so this is now our data. And what we can do, of course, remember, we can say select everything from a table or select, let's say, P name from people. This is something that we can do. Um, and then we get the names. But now what I want to do is I want to say, okay, give me the names and also all the items that these people uh, own. So I want to have a combination, I want to know, okay, this is the name of the person and this person owns this thing. This is what I want to have here. So in order to do this, what I have to do is I have to introduce a joint. So I can say here, select P name. And then for example, T underscore name from people. And now I have to join the people table um, on a specific column with the things table, or in this case, we could also do it with the ownership table. Uh, we're going to do it first with the things. Um, this is why we had the T owner here. So this is again, the one to n, or the one to one relationship. Now, right now, it's one to n. Um, th this might be a little bit confusing now, because we have both we have the one to n here. And we also have the n to m down here, because we have also a separate table. But I kept both to show you the concept here. What we can do is we can say, okay, P name, T name from people, and then we can specify a join. And the basic join that we can do is the inner join, I'm going to explain here now what this means here in a second, people inner join things on people dot P underscore ID equals things dot T underscore owner. So we basically say, okay, people PID is the same thing as things dot T owner, join these tables on these two columns, match the records and select them. And this would give me this output here, we have the person and the thing that this person owns. As you can see, now what you can see here, and this is the concept now of the inner join, you can see that Mike non owner is not listed. And you can also see that the MATLAB fan license is not or fan membership is not listed here either. So things that have no match are not listed. This is the concept of the inner join, we only display the records where we have a match. So the thing owner has to be a person has to be present. And the person has to actually own something. Otherwise, we're not going to include uh, these things in the result set. Now, if I want to include all the people, no matter what, no matter if they own something. So I also want to see Mike non owner here, but I don't want to see that he owns anything. So I we'll see null here, but I want to have Mike non owner listed in the result set, uh, because I want to have all the people, then I have to do a left outer join. So just a left join here, meaning everything from the left table, which is this one here, this is left, this is right, everything from this table will be included, even if it has no match. 
So right now you can see we have all the people also Mike non owner, but he owns nothing. If I want to do it the other way around, I want to have all the things including the MATLAB fan membership, but not all the people, then I can do a right join. Now we have this item here as well, but no one owns it. Uh, there is also the concept of a full auto join, but we're going to cover this in the next video because I have to introduce something new uh, so that we can do a full auto join in at least my SQL. Uh, there are, I think, database systems where you can just do full join or full outer join. Um, I don't think that it works like this in MySQL. So yeah, uh, we're going to talk about this in the next video. But one thing that's also important to mention is that when you just use join, like this, this just does uh, an inner join. And then also there is the concept of the cross product of the cross join, you can just say people cross join things, and then you get uh, the cross product. So every item matched with every item from the other table, which, you know, if, if you need it, for some reason, you can do it. So those are the basic joints. Um, what we can do now is we can try to query uh, specific, specific things here. So for example, we could say, uh, give me all the, the things that share ownership. So I can say, um, give me all the, all the, uh, all the people that own the same thing, and also the thing that they own. So what I can do for this is I can say, select, and then uh, I can say p, uh, or actually p, p1 dot p underscore name uh, as person one, for example, then p2 p name as person two, and then uh, t underscore name as shared thing like this. Uh, and of course, I use uppercase for all these things. So those would be the fields. And now I have to specify where I get them from. And I can do I can say the, the following thing from ownerships uh, or ownership 01 join ownership 02 on 01 dot o underscore thing equals 02 o underscore thing. So we we access the same table twice, we want to have the same thing. But we're going to add the condition that o one underscore, uh, or actually o one underscore o um, one dot o underscore uh, owner is not equal. So is different than o two o underscore owner. And then we want to join this again, with people p one on o one underscore o dot o underscore owner equals p one dot p underscore ID. And we copy this p two is the owner of the other table. And then the thing we join it on things as well, things t on o one dot o underscore thing equals t and then uh, t underscore ID. So what are we actually doing here? We're accessing the ownership table twice, with the condition that when we find uh, a thing that is present in both tables, so we look at ownership one ownership two, which is the same table, of course, but we look at it, we have to find two different owners that own the same thing. So the thing is the same, the owners are different, this is the condition here for the join. And then we say, okay, the owner one has to be person one, the owner two has to be person two, and the thing is the thing, which of course, by this condition here is the same. And those people are, of course, different because of this condition, and then give me the shared things. So I run this. And you can see here, Jane Smith and Bob Brown and Bob Brown and Jane Smith, which is redundant, of course, own a watch, they share this thing, which is, of course, true, as we can see here, they own both uh, the fifth item here. All right. Um, yeah, so that is a simple core or, or actually not, not too simple, probably for a beginner, but a, uh, a core that you can do just with joints without any more advanced structures here. 
Now let's also let us now also introduce another table. We're going to do it uh, up here, a friendship table. So we can say here create table if not exists friendship or friendships plural. Actually, I should have also called it ownerships, but doesn't matter now. Um, and we're going to say that this table here is going to have uh, a friend or f underscore friend one, which is going to be an integer f underscore friend two, which is going to be an integer. And we're going to say that the primary key here is going to be f friend one f friend two. And then we're going to say that the foreign key constraint um, for f underscore friend one, this references people p underscore id. And of course, I copy this one more time for friend two, because of course, it's the same reference to p, under, uh, p underscore id for uh, people, I can run this now. And now we have a friendship table for this. Again, I'm going to copy some sample data here. Uh, just so I don't have to type it while making this tutorial. So I'm going to load it into my clipboard, I'm going to paste it here. There you go. And now we have just some basic friendships also with comments here so that you have the overview of what is actually happening here when we use these uh, IDs. And now I can say, for example, that I want to see all the friendships. So I want to see the names of all the people that are friends. So we can say select p1, which is person one dot p underscore name as friend one, p2, p underscore name as friend two, uh, from friendships, and then join people p1 on friendship friendships dot f underscore friend one equals p1 dot p underscore id and then I can copy this and do the same thing for uh, people two and friend two. So like this. And this just lists no, it doesn't. Okay, oh, did I execute this? I think not. There you go. So now we have all the friendships that are present in a table, but not listed as IDs, but as names, as you can see here. Uh, yeah, and of course, we can do some more uh, combined queries here as well, you can do stuff like, okay, show me, uh, you know, if I want to have an item, which friend would I have to ask? So for each person, show me a friend that owns this item or something, you can just combine joins the way you want, you can just add more and more joins, you can add left joins, right joins, uh, inner joins, you just combine the tables, you join them on the foreign keys, and then you can uh, query across tables. It's a very simple concept, actually. So when you see these two examples, if you understand these two examples, you can basically model any other example here, like uh, joining across three different tables, four different tables, uh, friendships, ownerships, people and things, whatever you want. Uh, but yeah, this is how you model relationships in a MySQL or in, in SQL uh, in general, in a SQL database and how you do joints. All right, so we still have the tables here from last time people things ownership and friendship, as well as the sample data that we inserted into those tables. And today we're going to talk about set operations and set operations basically allow us to combine the result sets of different queries in different ways. This is what we're going to talk about today. And last time I introduced you guys to the concept of joints, we talked about inner joints about left outer joints and right outer joints. And I mentioned that there is something like a full outer joint, but you cannot do it just like uh, j just by writing full outer join in MySQL, you have to use a set operation. So remember, we can say select and then for example, a person name, a thing name from people. And then I can say inner join things on uh, people or actually just p id equals t underscore owner. This does an inner join. So only the entries that have a match are displayed. And if I say left join, which is a left outer join, 
uh, I get all the people even if they own nothing. And if I say right join, I get all the things even if they have no owner, but I don't get all the people that own no things. If I want to combine these two, if I want to have all the people and all the things, even if they own nothing, and even if they're owned by no one, uh, I can say left join. And then instead, uh, instead of using a semicolon, I can say union. So I can combine this result with the result of another query. So I can copy this one, I can paste it down here. And I can use a right join, and then I can add a semicolon at the end. And by doing that, I make both queries and I combine the result set. So you can see all the matches, you can see the owner or the person that owns nothing, and the item that is not owned by anyone uh, combined here with a union. And this is just the result. This is just a combination of these two queries. So this is what union does union takes the results of two queries and combines them into a combined result. Uh, now, what's important here is that when we have duplicates like John Doe owning a bicycle in both sets, we don't have to list it twice. However, if for some reason you want to list it twice, so you want to have all the entries from above and all the entries from below and even duplicates should be combined by listing them twice, you can use union all. So select union all select and then you get all these entries combined. So John Doe bicycle, John Doe guitar. Um, there you go, Jane Smith laptop, Jane Smith laptop. So you have duplicate values here. So this is the concept of union versus union all union gives you only uh, everything once. Uh, so the combination but everything is just listed once and union all just combines all the results. Um, then there's also the intersection. So I can say intersect and this basically means uh, we do a logical end operation. I don't know why, by the way, but for some reason, the MySQL workbench doesn't highlight this command, but it still works. Uh, so we select a left join, we select a right join. And all we want to have is the intersection. So what do they have in common only print that and of course, in this case, this would result in an inner join. So I would eliminate everything that's just present here or just present here, I want to have it present in both the sets to list it in the final result set. So this is what intersect does. It's a logical and, um, and then we also have an accept. Now an accept basically means give me everything from the first result set, except for all the things that occur in the second result set. So in this case, if I say accept, what do you think will happen? It will give me only Mike non owner because that's the only thing that is present here that is not present here because all the other uh, roles that are present here are also present here. Um, which is why I get Mike non owner. Now I can also say something like uh, left join here, or actually I can keep the right join. And I can add a condition, for example, where, uh, I don't know where p underscore uh, h is above 30. And then I'm going to get a limited set down here. So I'm not going to include all the people below 30, which are included here. So I can include them in the difference here in the set difference. So those are the four set operations that you need to know about union to combine union all to combine even with duplicates intersect to only get what they have in common and accept to compute the set difference. So that's it for today's video. I hope you enjoyed it and hope you learned something. If so, let me know by hitting the like button and leaving a comment in the comment section down below. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to this channel and hit the notification bell to not miss a single future video for free. Other than that, thank you much for watching. See you in the next video and bye.